when the Buddha boiled down the message of his awakening, it came down to a principle of cause and effect. When this is, that is. When the arising of this comes the arising of that. When this isn't, that isn't. From the cessation of this comes the cessation of that. It sounds pretty dry and formal. And as the Buddha said, it doesn't convey the totality of his awakening, but it was the most important part of the message, the part that was worth conveying to other people. And these things arise because of causes, and it's a little complex because sometimes the, the relationship is immediate. When this is, that is. They coexist. Other times it's stretched out over time. From the arising of this comes the arising of that. It could happen at any time. But it's because it's complex that we have free will, that there is a practice. That we can explain suffering and also explain an end to it. There are patterns to follow. And patterns to discover. Because the practice is not simply a matter of simply following instructions. You look at the Buddha's meditation instructions, and in some cases they're pretty general. And it's up to us to fill in the blanks. This is where our own powers of observation, our own ingenuity, play an important role. Because after all, we're after insights into the mind, insights into our desires, insights into our ways of thinking. And insights don't come simply by being obedient and following instructions. They come from looking on your own. seeing unexpected things. And also particularly in particular seeing what you're doing and what the results are. Because when the Buddha talks about the Four Noble Truths, it's, he's not talking about something abstract and far away. It's something extremely personal. The fact that our unskillful desires give rise to suffering. Skillful desires can bring an end to suffering. And our desire is about as intimate a part of ourselves as you can imagine. And yet we often don't examine them carefully enough. So what the Buddha is asking us to do is look specifically when you desire something, what are the results? Does it result in the happiness you wanted or not? Most people spend their whole lives desiring this, that, and the other thing, and then coming back to this, that, and the other thing over and over again. And are they ever learning about the last time they went after this, that, and the other thing? There's something in us that resists having our desires inspected. But there's another part of us that wants to find happiness and is not satisfied with the way things are, otherwise we wouldn't desire anything. So we're caught here. We desire things many times in unskillful ways. We don't like, part of us doesn't like it, but part of us is stuck on our old ways. And the way out is learning to come to your senses and realize you've got to look at this process. You've got to see it in terms of cause and effect. If you can't do this, there's no way the practice is going to get anywhere. So 
So one, it does mean accepting that you have certain desires that you'd rather not admit to yourself. This is where the role of acceptance comes into the practice. But that's not the whole story. Once you've admitted what kind of desires you have, then you look at what happens to, as a result. got to see things in terms of cause and effect, and particularly the causes coming out of your own, mi own mind, because those are the ones that are causing the main trouble. This is why when we meditate, it's not simply a matter of just watching, watching, watching. If you're going to see cause and effect, you have to fiddle around with the causes, otherwise you can't be too sure which effect is connected to which cause. Because as that principle tells you, sometimes the causes arise at the same time as the effects, and sometimes it's over time. And only by manipulating the causes, playing with them, can you connect the cause with the effect. And that way you can learn. You can learn which of your desires actually are skillful and which ones are not. What you're doing is opening up a dialogue inside, but the mind already has its inner dialogue. A lot of times one part of the mind yells at another part of the mind, gets its way simply through force. Other times through subterfuge. But we're now opening up the mind to a different kind of dialogue where everything has to be related to cause and effect. That's why the Buddha stressed this as his most central teaching. And do you really want to be happy? Well, look at what you've been desiring, the way you've been doing things. It's been causing suffering. How much longer are you going to want to keep at it? That's the question you've got to ask. At the same time, you have to offer different kinds of pleasure to pull the mind out of its old desires. But again, this kind of pleasure is there to provide a new type of desire, or to strengthen certain desires that are already there in the mind that tend to be weakened, especially here in this society, where so much emphasis is put on physical pleasure, sensual pleasure. But it's not just an issue in our society, it's everywhere. People identify with their desires, and part of them, they define themselves by their desires, and so it's hard to change. And to one, they can clearly see the drawbacks of their unskillful desires, and two, see the benefits of cultivating skillful ones. This is why when we meditate, we focus on developing a sense of ease, a sense of rapture. It's not simply a matter of being able to do it once and say, okay, I'm no longer attached to that, I'm no longer excited by that, I can move on to other things. These are your basic nourishment as meditators. You've got to look at the breath, see how the breath is comfortable, see how it's not. See what you're doing to make it comfortable and see what you're doing to make it not. And that way the meditation becomes more of a skill. And it gives you the energy you need to do the right thing. Because so often we know what's right and yet we can't do it because we, don't have, we lack the strength. It's just too much for us. But when the power of concentration gets developed and it gets stronger and stronger, you find that you do have the energy. Okay, this is the right thing to do. It makes perfect sense to do it. Why not do it? The Buddha says to abandon sensual craving, to abandon the craving for becoming, for craving for no becoming or annihilation. When you directly see that these are really unskillful desires and you have an alternative and you've got the strength to follow that alternative, it's a lot easier to do it, to do the right thing. So the results you get are the ones you want. So the simple practice of focusing on the breath, making it comfortable, once it's comfortable, allowing it to spread throughout the body. That sense of comfort saturates the body. It's basic instruction in cause and effect. And it's through pursuing this practice to ever more subtle levels of refinement that leads to the kind of insight that we want. Insight is 
It's like physical strength. The more you exercise, the stronger it's going to be. You've got to use it. You can't sit and just wait for it to happen by following rules or sitting very still. You've got to look at what you're doing, be clear about what you're doing, and then change it a little bit to see if you get better results. And then as the mind gets more sensitive to what it's doing, what the results are, this is how you follow that pr principle of cause and effect all the way to the kind of awakening that makes a big difference in the mind. The big shifting of underground plates, geological plates. That happens when you start seeing connections that you've been hiding from yourself all along. And once the mind has begun to see that difference, it really appreciates it. That this is what the practice is all about. This is what makes it rewarding. It re requires a big shift because, as I said, we define ourselves by our desires, and here we are in the process of changing them. So it means we have to learn which ones we want to hold on to, which ones we want to let go. It's a combination of a self-strategy and a not-self-strategy. Things you're used to hold on to, you begin to realize there's, there are good reasons not to. There's a principle of cause and effect at oper on operation there. that leads to suffering. You don't want it. So why hold on to it? Why claim it as yourself? That kind of activity. Feeling or perceiving or constructing thoughts or being conscious in that particular way. So you let go, let go, let go as you're holding on to things that are more and more refined, more and more skillful. Without the things you're holding on to, you couldn't let go. It's like climbing a ladder. To let go of one rung, you've got to hold on to a higher one. This is how you get up to the up to the roof. Then you can be on the roof. Then you can let go of the ladder entirely. You don't need any of these desires. Because once you open to that experience of the deathless, it comes. As you let go, let go, let go of everything that's unskillful, you finally get to a point of what they call non-fashioning. When that opens up, then it's not a question of whether you like it or not. It simply creates a new dynamic. Desire is no longer needed there. There's no lack, there's no limit. That's when both your self-strategy and your not-self-strategy have done all their work. And there's no need to define you, even at that point. There's nothing really that, anything that needs to be described. It's that radical. But in the meantime, we've got work to do. We've got to use our imagination. As I said, the Buddha's instructions are general. They point out the general guidelines. But you have to use your own ingenuity, your own powers of observation, to play with the principles of cause and effect, to see how they apply to the most intimate parts of your mind, your desires for this, your desires for that, your desire for happiness, sorting out which ones are really skillful and which ones are not. And applying all of your mental powers. To understand how cause and effect are operating in your search for happiness. Someday you'll see, you'll have your own awakening, and you'll see why. The Buddha put so much emphasis on that principle of cause and effect.
not that it's the whole of the awakening, but it's the essential part that gets you there. And once you've gotten there, the, as I said, the Buddha didn't have to describe the rest of it. He described only the part that was necessary for bringing you to that place. Where things open up. And then you can know for yourself what the rest of that experience is like.